Thanks. I'm really looking forward to being at Caltech this fall. Today I'm going to tell you about transit service. And I wanted to show first a movie of one of our closest transit events. Unfortunately, most events are not like the transit of Venus. We don't actually get to see the planet crossing in front of the star. The star is just too far away. But we can actually do a pretty good job learning about planets even when they transit stars that are much farther away. Today, we're all going to go on a voyage together. And this voyage is going to be to try to find a transiting Earth-like planet. Along the way, we're going to touch on a bunch of different topics. We'll talk about how to design a transit survey and how we might then constrain the properties of the planets we detect. We'll also talk about how to account for selection effects and how to estimate planet occurrence rates. We're going to begin with an assumption, and that assumption is that we're going to say that 1% of stars host hot Jupiters. We can debate this number later, but this is just a starting point for now. Then the question I have for all of you is if we take that to be true, how many stars do we need to look at in order to find just one transiting hot Jupiter? And as it turns out, the first thing we need to think about is geometry. We need to consider the likelihood that we would happen to be in a privileged location where we would see a planet cross in front of the surface of the star. So we could imagine that in some parts of space, say if we're located over here, we might actually see the planet cross in front of the star in what we would call a full transit event. Other times, though, we might actually be up here or down here, and then we would see part of the planet cross just the very edge of the star, and that would be a grazing transit event. One of the things we need to determine in order to figure out whether we'll see a full event or a grazing event or just no transit at all is how far away the planet is from the star at any given time. So we're going to do some quick geometry. We're going to start off with our planet in an elliptical orbit around the star. And we've learned in our geometry classes and astronomy courses that this distance here is just the semi-major axis and that the offset of the star from the center is just a times e. And then we can define the apoapse and the periapse as when the planet is farthest away or when the planet is closest to the star. And now we're going to define a direction to place our observer. And we're arbitrarily going to put our observer down here in the corner. We can now think about a bunch of angles to define. And the first of these angles is going to be the offset between periastron and our arbitrary reference direction. And that's just going to be the longitude of periapse, which we heard about yesterday. Another angle we can define is what we call the true anomaly. And that's where the planet is right now compared to where periastron is. And then, since we're concerned about our little observer down in the corner, we also want to think about what theta is at any given instant. And that's just going to be the combination of the true anomaly and the longitude of periastron. So that's a lot of terms and numbers to keep track of. Um, but remember, what we were after was just how far away is the planet from the star. And what we find here is in the corner, so it's just related to the semi-major axis times 1 minus the eccentricity squared over 1 plus e times cosine of true anomaly. And we can turn this into a transit probability. And if you want to learn more about how to do this and how to think about orbital geometries, I encourage you to check out Murray and Gurea. And it looks like we're cut off on the top here, so I'm going to switch views so you can see everything. We can now think about transit probability. And this is a longer expression, where here on the top here, you can either do plus RP or minus RP, depending on whether you're thinking about full transit events or grazing transit events. And if you are in a situation where perhaps you can make some simplifying assumptions, say you only care about planets in circular orbits, where the planet is pretty far away from the star, there is an easier number for you to remember, so you can jot it down at parties on cocktail napkins. And that number is that the transit probability is just the stellar radius over the semi-major axis. Putting this into actual numbers, what we would find is if we have a planet that's in a 3.5 day period, orbiting a star like the Sun, the odds that that planet would appear to transit are 10%. We can change the size of our star. If we go from, say, a sun-like star to an early M dwarf or a late M dwarf, where here this is about 50% the size of the sun, this is maybe 20%. We go from 7% to 4%. If we want to put the planet out, where it receives the same amount of light from the star as the Earth does from the sun, our transit probability decreases. We end up with half a percent in the sun-like star case. We get higher numbers for these cooler stars because they emit less light, and therefore a planet that could be habitable has to be moved closer in towards the star. 
So now we go back to our initial question. We said that we have 1% of FGK stars hosting hot Jupiters. We just saw that roughly 10% of those should transit. So what that means is that if we want to find a single transiting hot Jupiter, we probably want to look at n star, where n star is just, combining those two numbers together, 1,000 possible stars in our sample. Now, where are these 1,000 stars? How do we find them? How do we observe them? And that's just to find one transiting hot Jupiter. So the first question I have for you is, what kind of precision do we need in order to see this hot Jupiter around a star like the Sun? Well, to first order, the transit depth is just the ratio of the planet radius over the stellar radius squared. And the reason why this is a squiggly equals instead of an actual equals is that stars are not perfectly uniformly illuminated in bodies like this. There's limb darkening. So what you'd see is something more like this, where the center of the star appears brighter and the limbs appear fainter. What impact does this have on our transit curve? Here's a figure from Meg Schwab made for the Planet Hunters blog, which is actually a really nice resource if you haven't read it before. And here she's showing the relative flux versus just a distance measure uh, for a whole bunch of different planets crossing in front of a star, where here the blue planet is 10 Earth radii. And what you see if you look at this is that this is a very box-shaped event, where you have a flat time when the star is not blocked by the planet, then the planet quickly crosses onto the surface, planet crosses across the star, then egress here, and back to regular flux. That looks nice and ideal, but with our actual star with limb darkening, what we measure is something that looks a little bit more U-shaped. So we have curvature on the bottom here. And you might also see curvature in your light curves depending on what the impact parameter of the planet is. So as you're fitting your data, there's a bit of a degeneracy between the planet size, the impact parameter, and your limb darkening assumptions. And of course, you could throw in star spots, and then you might have little bumps in the bottom as well. So in an ideal case, you should really think about limb darkening. But for now, we're going to go back to our simplistic assumptions and assume that transit depth is just planet radius over stellar radius squared. So now we're going to put numbers on this. We have a star like the Sun, and we have a planet like Jupiter. And for a planet like Jupiter, the planet-star radius ratio is such that we would expect a decrease in brightness of 1%. For something like Neptune, we get 0.1%. And for the Earth, we're left with a shockingly tiny 84 parts per million. This is terrifying if you're trying to find Earth-like planets in the galaxy. But fortunately, we have an escape route. We can look at different types of stars. So let's say we're going to put the sun to the side, pull up a, laid, uh, a large early M dwarf. And in that case, for a Jupiter-sized planet, we get a 3% transit depth. If we decide that actually we like bigger stars more, we could look at an F star and see about half a percent transit depth. So putting this in perspective once more, here we have transit depth versus host star radius, and each of these lines is a different size planet. And what you see is what you probably know intuitively, that to find a very small planet, like this Earth-sized planet here, it really benefits you to look at smaller stars. So now we need to think about the kind of signal to noise we might achieve with our surveys. There are a ton of terms here, but basically what happens is that the signal you see depends on how much flux you get from your target star, and then you also need to tie in things like shot noise, sky noise, read noise, and dark noise. So that's a lot of terms, but we can make things a little bit easier for ourselves because for the most part, we're looking at very bright stars. So we're going to assume in this case that our shot noise, this first storm here, is actually much larger than the sky noise, the read noise, and the dark current. So now we can just say that we're basically in the regime where our signal depends on the square root of the amount of photons we receive in our chosen integration time. So adding numbers once more, here I have different sizes of telescopes and different integration times, and we're looking at the precision we might achieve for the transit of a 10th magnitude star. And these numbers are in parts per million, so depending on our survey setup, we might go anywhere from five parts per million, that'd be great, up to a couple thousand parts per million. And remember, for an Earth, we're looking for 84 parts per million. That's pretty small.